So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 12th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping 101. Oops, I meant Backyard Beekeeping episode number 101. And it is 48 degrees Fahrenheit outside. That's 9 degrees Celsius for a lot of you out there. I'm glad you're going to spend your time with me today and see what kind of topics we're going to talk about, which will be listed down in the video description below, so you can look that up. And uh, there's been a lot going on. We had a break in the weather, but as you can see from the opening here today, we had a lot of opportunity for the bees to fly. Can look at the colonies and see what's going on, who's alive and who's not. Don't get too comfortable. We still have a lot ahead. So they're flying, they're getting pollen. They are not getting any meaningful nectar sources. So they're still relying on what's inside the hives. So keep the emergency feed on too. And uh, so I already said, if you wanna know what we're gonna talk about, look down in the video description. And what else is going on? Well, there's a playlist, by the way. This 101 episodes now is in a single playlist that you can click on. And once you subscribe to the playlist, assuming that you have YouTube, then every time a new video gets added, it just automatically adds to your playlist and it will play them in order for you because I've been receiving requests from people asking how they can find them in order because when they go on YouTube and do a search, it just shows all these episodes in various orders. So that's how you do it. You get the playlist. Also, you can listen to this on Podbean. Podbean, the way to be. And this is, by the way, the way to be. Thank you for being here. Also, last week we had the 100th episode and we did a competition and there was a winner. The winner is Andrew Lopez from California. So congratulate Andrew if you see his comments there. Some people did have problems with their posts because you had to put a link in your response. So if you write something on any of my YouTube videos, and if there's a link to another YouTube or another web page or something like that, it automatically gets held. So you can probably still see it. You can see that it's posted. And uh, it does go on auto hold and then I have to release the links. Now, if there's a competition or something like that, it's not the end of the world because, you know, it's first person with the correct answer that wins. And uh, Andrew had a very early, the first person to answer at all. So he was the first all around and he happened to have the correct answers. But for those who were frustrated when they wrote the post, included the link and it didn't show up, uh, that gets released. And the good news is once I release it, it pops up visible to everyone after that and it retains its order. So in other words, it shows up, you know, if you look at these answers and comments from people and you have a little tick mark up there that you can organize them by the most popular answers or answers most recent first. And then you go all the way to the bottom and you can see who had the first answers. So Andrew had a very thorough answers with links. Those of you that were frustrated by that, I'm sorry. They don't get deleted. They can appear to go away, but they're just being held. So, and that's true too for people that use, you know, bad language. It automatically gets held. Anyway, so it doesn't really go away. It's just momentary. And the other thing is... My Long Langstroth hive, it was looking really good before. It's not looking so good right now. They may not be as mobile through those horizontal frames through winter here as I originally thought they would be. So coming up, I'm going to have to do an inspection on them as soon as the weather finally breaks for real. They were flying strong uh, several weeks ago, but here with the recent warm up, they were not one of the strong flying colonies. A little handful of bees coming and going. This can be deceiving. Don't freak out on your beehives uh, this time of year. If you're in a cold climate, some of the top performing bees aren't even flying yet, while others are zipping out there because they've exhausted the resources and they need everything. So what you saw in the beginning here is I have put out dry pollen sub, the only dry pollen substitute that I use, and I only started using it last year, and that is Ultra Bee Dry Pollen Sub from Man Lake. And notice too that the container I put out is really small. I have one of those big 25 pound feeders, but uh, I don't have the population of foraging honeybees to make use of 25 pounds of Ultra Bee Dry Pollen Substitute. So what I do is now I put out that clear, it's like a Tupperware bin that I put out there and I put a cover on it, but here's the thing. 
at nighttime, I pull it in and put it away. The other thing is I refresh the pollen every day. So in other words, I'm not leaving pollen out there day after day after day until it gets used up. I throw it away in the garbage. The following day, if the weather's going to be good and they're going to be flying, then I put a new fresh batch of pollen substitute out there because we're backyard beekeepers. We can pay attention. We have a lot of time. We're going to see what's going on. And I put a camera on there so I can log into my computer and I can see what the levels of pollen sub currently are and how many bees are using it. And then I get my logbook out and say, hmm, 48 degrees Fahrenheit, sunny. They're eating that pollen. So they're taking it back and... Then you go and you look at your landing boards of your beehives to see if your bees are the ones bringing that pollen sub home. We don't want to feed our neighbors bees. We don't care about those people's bees. Let them feed themselves. So what I like to do is you can see they get all sugar coated with uh, pollen sub. Then you go back to your landing boards and you look to see the bees that are landing and bringing in the pollen subs. Those dusted little bees are coming back. So now we know we're feeding our own bees. And this is, in my opinion, the best way to boost your bees in spring before the real pollen starts to kick in in the environment. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on today too. So that's what's going on out of my bee yard and you saw it at the beginning and of course I'm going to play a few slow motion sequences while we talk today. So the long lang not looking good and by the way our way to be fellowship the way to be on Facebook some of you do not have Facebook anymore I understand that. For those of you who want to be on Facebook and want to join those discussions, we have over a thousand members and day and night they are talking about everything. So there's a lot of activity going on in there. All comments are welcome. All levels are welcome. So you can go there, meet friendly people, talk about bees. Let's jump right into this now with Jim Buns from Dunville, Ontario, Canada. Let's see, my query is... Can I rub Ultra B directly into the combs for the bees when weather doesn't allow flight to the feeding stations outside the hives? I seem to waste more pollen substitute patties than they consume when placed on top of the frames. This is something that I say over and over all the time and I'm going to continue right now. I don't put any dry pollen substitutes inside the hives ever. I don't mix it with the sugar. I don't mix other... Uh, stimulants. I'm not going to put it into sugar syrup suspension because I want the bees to be able to do their jobs cleanly because we have pollen foragers. We have water bees. Those are different. And the things that we keep inside our hive, just happen to have this handy. So now this is one of any pollen patty. These are not pollen sub patties. These patties have pollen in them. This particular one has 15% real pollen. This is the time of year. Don't waste them. Don't store them. Put them out there. The bees will use them if they want them. And if they don't, they won't. So here's the thing. Like, we had a recent warm-up. Hit 60 degrees here. Just north of me. North, it doesn't make sense, I know. But they went to 70-something. They set almost a record. But here, we got the 60s and sunny. I'll take it. The bees were flying like crazy. So anyway, uh, what's about to happen now, though? So they brought in the pollen, and that means that they're, the queen is laying, that they've got brood going, they're getting ready for the spring buildup because the real nectar flow is going to happen. They're building up ahead of it. So they're using stored honey resources still in the hive. They're bringing in pollen as quick as they can when they have the opportunity to do it. And as described here, they're ignoring some of the pollen patties that are inside. So I know that we want to give them as much as we can and get them going but if they're not eating the pollen patties inside, they don't need it. I think it's better for them to take advantage of those breaks in the weather when they fly out. The other thing is, because I have a camera on that pollen feeder, I like to see how early in the day, how cold the bees are going to fly. Once there is a known source of pollen, which is the best, or a pollen substitute, which is a substitute for the pollen, just to tide them over until real pollen kicks in. But Ultra B dry pollen substitute has been proven scientifically through study and evaluation to prove to prove it has been proven to work to boost early brood rearing in your colonies of bees so it's the only one that i would put out as a feeding system 
So then the next thing is, and by the way, this one is by Natural Apiary, but I'm not locking you into that. I'm not saying that this performs better than any of the others. Lots of companies make these pollen patties. So real pollen patties are going to be the most expensive, but they're also going to be the ones that are going to boost your bees. So now that they're out there pulling in the pollen as quick as they can, what's going to happen this weekend? We're going right back down to freezing temps, particularly at night. So uh, having pollen patties inside your hive uh, will provide them the resources they need so they don't start dropping back on their brood numbers. Once they start building brood, once we start feeding them, it is very important for us to continue feeding. Better that you had not started feeding at all and not artificially stimulated their brood buildup than to start feeding, than to back off and stop feeding. Let your, let your pollen um, feeders run out, for example. So make sure you have plenty of surplus for that. But as far as artificially installing pollen inside the hive to get them to eat it when they're ignoring the patties, there is something that you can do. And this is for the future. So, because a lot of people won't be prepared to do this right now. So what I do is I collect pollen because I had to evaluate uh, pollen traps. So pollen traps collect the pollen on its way into the hive and it forces the bees to go through little openings and the pollen balls fall off of their legs. So then you can take those and you can save those, you can freeze them. Then, if you want to create frames, if you have frames of drawn comb, drawn beeswax cells, right? Now this is, this gets into really messing with your bees a lot more than I personally would like to, but if somebody really wanted to know and really had to feed their bees pollen and they wanted to make sure that it was suitable for them, this is how you can fake out your bees. So for those who want a completely natural approach, this is not for you. But so you collected pollen from the bees for a pollen trap last spring, this time of year after the real pollen kicked in and the really strong colonies were bringing it in, you harvested some of that. You can actually pour it into the open cells, sprinkle it in there, do, 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 just like a field bee that collected the pollen comes in, they go directly to the cells, they scratch them off their hind legs, and they drop off these little pollen balls in the cells. Then you can spritz it just enough to make it damp with one-to-one -one sugar syrup. One-to-one -one sugar syrup will ferment on its own unless it's kept cool. So after you've put your little pollen balls in those cells and you spritz it with your sugar syrup, they go right to the freezer or any situation where they're held at a very low temperature. They don't necessarily have to be at freezing temps, but the colder the better because we want to preserve two things. The freshness of the pollen that the bees are bringing in, that's critical because otherwise it loses its nutritional value and they can't make bee bread out of it. The other thing is the one-to-one -one sugar syrup that you sprayed in the cells on top of the little pollen balls that are in there, we don't want that to ferment. We don't want that to spoil. So fermentation is arrested at below temperatures of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so it won't ferment. The colder it is below that, though, we also are going to preserve the goodness of those pollen balls. Now, once the frames get dropped in, outside, of, so wherever the brood frames end that they're working on, you replace the outermost frame adjacent to them. And then you're going to find out the bees will start working it and they'll then because it does warm up they do start to allow it to ferment and then once it reaches its maximum fermentation potential they seal it up and they use it to feed their bees so they make bee bread with it. So for those of you who really have to meddle with your bees I'm not recommending that you do it, but if you have to and you're just so ADHD that you just have to do something to get in there to see if they can do it, that is one way to feed them their own pollen back. So that's pretty much all I have to say about that. So keep the pollen patties on. This is the time of year to do it if you're trying to boost them. Now what if you don't want to do that? What if they have plenty of honey and resources still on from wintertime? because you're tipping them and they look healthy and they're still flying and everything's good. So they have the resources. You could just wait and let them get the pollen from the environment on their own. So that's the natural approach. Just let them do it. Make sure that they don't need emergency resources and the dry sugar on top is an emergency resource. So you can leave them naturally, then their buildup will be slower. 
But if you're just a backyard beekeeper, you don't care about massive numbers of bees going into spring. You can also limit the propensity for them to swarm by not artificially building up their numbers. When you build their numbers, you have to be prepared to expand the colony, split the colony, things like that, get into production. Uh, so a backyard beekeeper, you just want to keep them alive. You want to see that they're doing normal things, they can follow the natural rhythm, and then you'll figure out which of your colonies of bees that you have left over going into spring have managed the best on their own. And hopefully you left them with enough honey resources to get through winter. Next question, Patrick Keeley, Hermiston, Oregon. Looking at building two long langs for this spring, starting with two nukes. Nukes are nucleus colonies of bees. So that means they're already in frames. They already have brood, pupa, larvae, everything all together, laying queen, they're all friends. Everything is working well. This is coming from a commercial breeder, getting them out of Hawaii. Would like to get something better next year in the long lang format. Will a colony on each end blocked off with queen excluders share a center honey storage space in the center or will they fight and kill each other? Thinking 10 frames on each end with queen excluders and 10 shared honey frames in the center. So for those of you who do that kind of thing where you have two colonies, separate two brood boxes, for example, two queens, then you've got the colonies, but you want those two colonies of bees and the brood boxes to contribute workforces to develop a honey collection force that magnifies the amount of honey that you're gonna get from them. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And then would they get along? So the one thing is we have to keep, those of you who do that, go ahead and comment down in the comment section below because we're in an area of beekeeping that uh, I don't personally have an interest in pursuing and that's individual colonies contributing to a common resource collecting group. So all the foragers would be storing their honey, nectar and everything else in a communal frame of, you know, box of frames that's supposed to magnify their ability to get more honey. But what I would do, and it, because I've been thinking about this after talking about last week with the guy that was trying to hide his hives. I mean, the guy that wanted to know how to have more than one colony of bees in a single hive so the neighbors wouldn't know how many. So this is a very basic drawing that I made. But what I would do, I like the long Langstroth format for this. You have a colony at each end. And I don't like the idea of combining them together in the middle, but what I do like the idea of, particularly in long winters, is to have them benefit from each other's heat, moisture management, thermal, thermal harvesting from one another. So you would have, by the way, a single, a single queen excluder used as a divider allows the bees to have physical contact with each other. Plus it's only a queen excluder. So who gets blocked? Only the queen. So the workers pass through freely. They're in touch with each other all the time. Sometimes it works where the bees, even though they have their own queen pheromones that identify them with their own colony mates, uh, they do sometimes cooperate like that. Keep in mind that bees, worker bees, the foragers in particular, have a tendency to drift to other colonies when they're loaded with resources and then they get accepted. It's kind of the same thing here. They're not invading each other's brood boxes. That's where they would get into some defensive behavior when they get deep into the things that are critical. They don't want them to get near the queen. They don't want them to get near the brood and all these protected areas. So to have them all mix it up in theory, it could work. So you could do it, I just don't like it. So I would have dual screens. I would have a standard divider board, screens on both sides with a hole through the middle. And this lets them vent warmth and humidity management, and everything else back and forth through winter because I think on the long Langstroth hive, you could do two or even three and I would have 25 frame capacity on either side. And I think just through sharing, these are, you know, we're just spitballing ideas that would help improve honey production 
for both of these colonies without necessarily mixing the workforce together because when we don't mix the workforce together, they're not mixing and rubbing elbows with each other and potentially spreading pathogens, varroa, and stuff like that. Because if you get one colony that gets sick, now you've got a communal nectar resource that they're all feeding out of. So you have the potential to contaminate or infect two different colonies. But we could have them share the same space without physical contact. And of course, we want their entrances to oppose one another. So there's not a lot of mistakes about where the individual bees live and when the foragers come and go, that they, that they go to the right place. But I have been thinking a lot about getting them to share warmth and stuff in these larger bodied, stationary, non-movable hives. So that's what I would find interesting. But if that does work, I hope that uh, Patrick will keep us informed and maybe go to the Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook and shows pictures of what you ultimately come out with and uh, how that worked. And if you, you know, had any issues, you know, does one have more Varroa than another? Are they, because these are commercial stock, commercial bees coming from Hawaii, didn't go into detail about whether or not they're naturally resistant. Are they hygienic bees? Is it a stock that uh, has not required treatment? Most commercial lines of bees are into maximum productivity and uh, they generally speaking require intervention for varroa mites and things like that. So just be very interesting to hear about how that goes going forward. Next question. Dirk Booms, Downington, Pennsylvania. We went to move our bees to a better spot this year. I assume now is the best time to do that, or are we too late? Now, this is a great time to do that because we still have enough cold going on that uh, the majority of the workforce isn't out there yet. So at least where I live or in a colder climate than Pennsylvania. So I have seen you previously say that uh, it is the climate not far from you facing the entrance South is best, but what about shade? Is it better to have sun all day, knowing that in summer this can be brutal? Or would it be better to have either sun in the morning or in the afternoon? We have a large property, so we can place them depending on which is best. When we move the hives, you have said just to put a branch at the entrance to get them to reorient themselves. We need to close it up for the day or two at first and so on. We'll talk about this. You can, wintertime is a great time to reorganize your bee yard. The hives, generally speaking, are especially coming out of winter, should be at their lightest before we get into that spring nectar flow. And hopefully we don't have to break apart these hives. If you've gone through winter with just a deep and a medium, for example, you can still move them around. So the question about whether to put them in sun or shade, there's been a lot of evaluation done and a lot of information gathering that shows that the shady hives tend to have more problems with things like small hive beetles. That the hives that are in the sun tend to do better overall. And I can say that to you for my own small apiary. That my hives, because I have them in sun and shade, and I have them with landing boards facing a bunch of different directions. And that's so I can keep logs through the years and uh, create a consensus of which configurations do the best and how they're placed and see if there's any correlation at all with uh, the landing board facing and whether there's sun or shade and then the configuration of the hive, which is how I arrived at what I'm doing right now. So what works best here in Pennsylvania. Hives with landing boards that face south or southeast, so the rising sun. Those are outperforming those with landing boards that are facing north and west. Sun or shade. Those that are sitting in full sunlight are outperforming those that are sitting in full shade or partial shade. So because you know, the sun, the idea that things can be brutal here. Now, other parts of PA, and I'm in, in the northern and western part of Pennsylvania. So I'm also at a much higher altitude than most of Pennsylvania. So my temperatures are lower and so on. But if you use an insulated hive cover, summer and winter, your bees will benefit from that. I also recommend that your hive covers be painted white right on top so they reflect heat. 
They're insulated to begin with, so we don't need to use them to heat things up. The other thing is, when we talk about summer heat, summer sun, where is the position of the sun? Straight down on top of the hives. So when the sun rises, the angle, the incident angle of the sun is almost directly down on the hive. So an insulated cover will handle most of that for you. The other thing is, you'll notice that my hives all have hive visors on them. And that's because the landing board on the front of the hive, especially midsummer when it matters the most, has at least a 15 degree drop in temperature. So the landing board is not just shielded from rainfall and uh, allows the bees to congregate outside uh, to help them ventilate the hive, even on foul weather days, because they congregate up underneath my hive visors and there's a mass of bees under there from time to time. It's pretty impressive. But uh, so I opt for the full sun because of critter management. So the small hive beetles and things like that. Shaded areas tend to be more damp. So when it comes to managing humidity, they do that better in the sunshine as well. And uh, so the other thing is when you're looking at your property, if you've got all this property, uh, also look at how damp or dry it is in the area that you're planning to put your hives. The other thing, because you're getting to move them, is uh, remember that here we've realized that 16 to 18 inches off the ground for that landing board keeps them away from skunks and other predators that would turn your friendly bees angry. Another question that was on here, oh yeah, to get them when you move them to a new location to get them to reorient. Do this movement at night when they're all in or in the face of an oncoming cold snap because that will push, and that's coming right up. This weekend, we have cold weather. So the bees are all gonna be inside. There aren't gonna be any flights. What a great opportunity to move them because then we don't even need that branch or the obstruction. Anytime you alter the entrance configuration, change the opening from over here to over here, something like that, or you can put a leafy branch or twigs or anything like that that they have to re-navigate around. When they find that that's unfamiliar, you'll see them doing orientation flights again, and then they'll head out. And that warm-up that we recently had, there was a lot of orienteering going on, a lot of orientation flights, and uh, the colonies looked really good. So false confidence sometimes can happen at this time of year because we think, yes, they're alive, they're making it. So the other critical step for me to look at was who's bringing in the pollen from the pollen sub that I put out there and uh, which colonies are bringing it in because there's only one reason they would be bringing in pollen sub. There's only one reason that they're gonna risk their necks on borderline warm and cold days to get it and bring it in there and that's because they're rearing brood. If they're rearing brood on that level and we had pollen coming in at 20 or 30 bees per minute way up from what we would have if you, for example, had a laying worker that's trying to survive and it's just laying drones, then you would expect to see less than 10 pollen loads per minute coming in when the pollen's available. So that's my advice. Yes, move. Yes, move ahead of the upcoming cold snap because it's going to keep them in anyway. Uh, the amount of time that you have to obstruct their entrance with something new to get them to reorient a couple of days is more than enough. And uh, because you have a lot of young bees that are going to be hatching out pretty soon, and it's going to more than make up for any bees that are going to be lost, the foragers that will take off. But uh, sun over shade, south to southeast facing landing boards, high enough to keep skunks and predators from harassing your bees. So that's my advice on that one. Next one, Mark Lowry. I have a question for next week. Have not been able to find an answer to this. Well, I hope I can help. I gave my hive some foundationless frames a week or so ago, and I just checked them today. Two of the frames are drawn almost completely with drone comb. And one of those frames is full of brood of all ages. I panicked until I saw a couple of full frames of worker brood. My question is, what do I do with a frame full of drones? Should I just let them be? Feed them to the chickens? Move them to the outer edge of the box in hopes that the bees will use them for storage after the drones emerge? Don't want to overmanage my bees. Okay, but there's a lot of things going on here. Now, I am shifting gears in my own apiary. So that's what I'm sharing is, is based on what I'm trying to do myself this year. And if it's a good colony, 
that did not require treatment for mites. That's my movement. I'm focusing on the colonies. We're going over, we're ignoring quantity for quality. So I want my best performing colonies, those that did not require mite treatments, had low mite numbers. Uh, the ones that I decided to keep that had higher mite numbers, they still get to be here. They still get to be out there. But uh, those are not the ones that I'm going to be breeding from. So those are the ones, those that require treatment that weren't handling things on their own, those are the ones I would be pulling the drones out of because I want to get those drones reduced in the environment because I want to reduce those genetics from spreading out to other queens that are going to be hatching out and making their mating flights this spring. Now, the colonies that I have that are strong, that did really well, that don't require treatment, those are the ones I'm focusing on, and you can expect to see 20% of the brood in those colonies be represented as drones. And I want them. I used to joke about that all the time. I want my drones out there mating with everybody else's queens. I'm going to turn this whole area into my line of bees. And that's funny, and I know it's a joke, and ha ha. But it's actually not that funny anymore because uh, I'm going to let the stock that's not doing well on its own, just gonna let them dwindle out. Uh, doesn't mean I'm gonna let them be taken over with mites. I'm gonna treat them. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking about is moving the colonies that have high mite counts to another location altogether. So then I have a smaller apiary that all would require treatment and intervention. That's not my breeding apiary. Now the ones that I would keep here at home are the ones that are treatment free, that are having low mite counts, obviously grooming behavior, hygienic behavior. They're handling everything great. Those are the ones that I'm gonna let those drones take off and fill the skies if I can. Because I want others around here. I have neighbors near me that have been keeping bees for decades and uh, have never bought a bee ever. So I think they might have through the years been collecting my swarms and that's fine. So I want them to get the best quality bees they can get and I want them to have access to the best drones that I can send out there. So the other thing is pulling these drones and moving to the outside. I don't like that idea because although you know past the 10th day, past the 9th or 10th day, the thinking is that they're not a big drain on your colony bees anymore because they're not being fed their cap, their pupa, right? But what do they still need? They still need to be warmed up because pupa, the brood, still needs to be right around 94, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And with the cluster right there over the brood, which is the most critical area, they're gonna maintain that warmth. But now we pull that frame and put it all the way out to the end. Oh, now we divided. The cluster has to go over here and has another area with capped brood that they have to keep warm. So in a way, they still are consuming energy from the colony because they have to have that warmth to survive. So I recommend keeping them right together, or if it's not a top performing colony, remove the drone brood altogether and feed it to your chickens as you described. I would take that opportunity to scratch out some of the pupa that are in there and see if there are varroa mites in there at all. So I would check that out. So I wouldn't move them to the edge and uh, you could of course feed them. And once those drone cells are put back on the outside of the frames or whatever, bees do use uh, drone cells and drone frames for nectar storage and pollen storage and things like that. So it does not go to waste. So I hope you got some food for thought there. Next question, tall cedars. That's the screen name there. Do worker bees clean varroa mites off the queen or can queens die from mites as well? Well, the last thing to die in a colony would be generally the queen. That's because the queen bee is the most protected bee in the entire colony. And she's protected from disease better than others. And hopefully she's protected from varroa mites better than others. If you've got a colony of bees, and there's a queen in there with varroa mites on the queen, anywhere on her body, let alone on her abdomen and feeding off of the queen, which would be a worst case scenario. 
But uh, if anything is getting to that queen, your bees have failed utterly. That's because nobody gets to see the queen. The queen has her own retinue of workers that are with her everywhere she goes. What's their job? They are constantly grooming the queen. They are constantly licking the queen. They are spreading her pheromone to other bees in the, in the colony. And just by design, they've never been out of the hive. So this, those that are in direct contact with the queen would be the cleanest bees in your colony, the, the freshest, most pristine, like the Vestal Virgins in Rome uh, back in the day. Anyway, they protect the queen. It would be extremely rare to see Varroa mites on the queen. And if it, if it did get that far, you have a failed colony. That is the last guard right there. So I'm sure you can find it somewhere. You may find that uh, Varroa can get on there. I've never seen it because I have, when I look at sp especially the bee weaver line of bees, sorry to beat that uh, drum all the time, but they're the ones that when they get in my observation hive, we see this ridiculous grooming behavior. Not just that, uh, bees coming in from the field, it's, I called it the car wash inside the colony of bees inside the hive because bees come from outside some of them go straight like if they've got pollen on their legs or something they go straight to get rid of it after they do some waggle dancing so there's a designated dance floor in there too that all the bees use over and over the field bees come in there and they're going to waggle dance they're going to waggle dance over here and the bees are looking for a place to go to forage to get stuff gather and wait there for somebody to come in and deliver that information through the waggle dance and uh off to the right of that, and I'm not saying that when you look at your colony, it will be off to the right, but there's another designated area, it appears to be, where it's a like a car wash for bees. And bees will actually go there and tremble around and get a grooming thing going. And the other thing is I noticed that some of these bees are so ADHD about grooming that they just, every bee that they encountered, they're just grooming them up. And uh, so it's a trait, it's a cleaning thing. And if they found mites on an incoming bee, they just go all over her. And I mean, they worked every inch, the antenna, the toes, the feet, the legs, under the wings, they get all over every micro inch of that worker bee and they groom like crazy. So when you have bees like that, that are that controlling and when they find a mite what do they do with it they bite its feet they chew it up they drop it on the bottom uh, it's pretty impressive and why a colony like that can get away without treatment the bee weaver family has not treated their bees for decades period they work with survivor stock exclusively which is where I'm headed back to, hopefully with more knowledge, more ability, better hive configurations, better hive placement, and continuing to work with uh, my own stock of bees on small scale, of course, because I'm a backyard beekeeper. But for tall cedars, do workers clean varroa mites off of the queen or can queens die from mites as well? They don't die from the mites, they die from the diseases, but the queen would be your last stand. If that were happening to the queen, could happen, extremely rare. All is lost if diseases and varroa mites get to the queen. Steve Kleinman, here we go. I would like to hear your ideas on why this happened. I have had two hives that I confirmed today died out. Both died due to starvation. Now, this is what a lot of backyard beekeepers, brand new beekeepers, are going to be dealing with this spring. A loss of their bees, dying due to starvation, which is evident when a bee, if you open up the hive, you look at it, you get a nice warm day, they're not doing what the other beehives are doing, and you see them nose deep in a bunch of cells, and then when you look at them, their abdomens are constricted. In other words, they're empty. So they have starved to death. This is something that's going to be hard on some people, by the way, and I highly recommend that you learn from it and don't quit beekeeping. Both went into winter with two deeps with plenty of honey. So just to recap, we want them to have 50 to 100 pounds of surplus honey 
going to winter here in the northeastern United States. And I'm not sure where Steve lives. But uh, I had given them two to one syrup and a wrap it around feeder in the fall. Because remember that if you feed two to one sugar syrup by weight, they will actually store it and use it as resources to fill the spaces that are not filled. If you had, for example, a dearth at the end of the year, much like we had right here where I live, we got a sudden dearth when we should have had lots of nectar coming in. And uh, the same feeder before the temperature turned to cold. So we also put dry sugar on top and let the bees explore it, which I highly recommended that people do. The bees had explored the feeders before they clustered for winter. In one hive, they consumed a fair bit of their honey. I thought that perhaps because the weather was consistently cold for such a long period of time, they were unable to move to areas of the hive that still had honey. So it sounds like even though we say the bees starved to death and they would have that telltale small body stuffed in cells and everything else, and this is what the most frustrating thing for new beekeepers to understand is, how can there be frames of honey nearby that they didn't go to and they sat right there and they died? So it says they were unable to move to areas of the hive that still had honey. In the second hive, they had consumed all of their honey. Now this leads me to something else. Neither availed themselves of the sugar in the feeder they had explored earlier. What did I do wrong? How could I have prevented this from happening again? So I had early on when I started keeping bees, I got Italian bees. I live in the north. And they seemed awesome because their numbers were huge and they didn't seem to really back off on brood rearing like other bees did. One of the side effects of that for me up here was with so much brood, they had high consumption, which means they used up all of their sugar, all of their honey, all their stored resources before the winter was halfway out. And uh, this is sometimes the difference between getting a stock of bees that is acclimatized to where you live. Now it's very forgiving. Like you can take Northern bees and they can survive in Southern climates. They just don't tend to do as well because they actually, when there are periods of dearth, they back off on brood rearing and things like that. They reduce their demand when the resources available are also reduced. So this is a problem with when you get southern lines of bees and bring them north, buying packages or nucleus colonies or things like that, and they're not acclimated to the environment that you live in. They have a different natural rhythm of reproduction that may be in contrast or in conflict with what your local environment is going to provide for those bees as far as the resources go. And some people make even more generalized statements about that. The darker the bee color, the more suited to the cold in the north they would be, the lighter, more golden and amber color the bees are, those are southern bees. And people like Dr. Leo Sherishkin make those observations and make those statements. So you can hear over and over that the biology of the bee, the genetics of the bee, should be your starting point for where you're going to keep your bees. After that, then you do everything you can to provide the environment under your control, the hive itself, how the hive is set up. We had double deeps here. That doesn't sound too bad. We also had uh, a rapid round feeder or some kind of feeder that had dry sugar in the top, which I have here too, and my bees were using. So once you've done all of these things, pick the right genetics, you've got your hive configured, you left enough on for the bees for winter, Plus the added two to one sugar syrup here, which I almost didn't do because my hives were maxed out. They're almost honey bound. So we have two things that go on that leave you with question marks over your head. One is the bees that starved to death and there's honey still in the hive. The other one is the colony of bees that consumed everything in the hive, but starved out because they were out of resources. I think uh, those bees were misfits for the environment that they were in. Now there's something else that we need to talk about because this is the complexity of beekeeping. This is why they're interesting and why they're frustrating all at the same time. And that is that you can try to do everything right and then your bees can utterly still fail you. 
So we need to know also what the Varroa mites were like, and not just going into winter, but in August and September when they're, the health of your colony is critical because pretty soon that stock is going to be creating your fat-bodied bees, your winter bees, and uh, we need to know what's going on there. So it's, it's the whole picture of how the bees are doing. And uh, so mite counts, things like that, all this information is missing from this description. The line of bees, the habitat that they're in, the temperature extremes that they're dealing with, treatments, if any, that were performed. Also, uh, what the Varroa levels have been in that colony as well. Is the hive top insulated? Is the hive itself an insulated hive? I don't have those, but I have hive tops that are insulated. So I have a lot more questions about this, and maybe we'll get more answers from Steve. But I want it to be a teaching tool for people that are listening right now. And uh, also, I don't want people to be discouraged because the statistics are very bad. Uh, people that begin with beekeeping and those who continue with beekeeping, a lot of people quit in their first year or two. And that's because they don't fully understand cause and effect and they take it personal. And that's that when a colony of bees die, uh, how can I keep this from ever happening again? That's all of our goals. So all the years that I've been keeping bees, my whole goal is to get bees through winter. And that's everybody's mar mark of success in the spring. How many colonies made it? How many of your bees survived? And uh, it's kind of a, it's a point of pride that, you know, if you get all your bees through, which is a miracle, it's, it's the exception, not the rule, to get all of your colonies of bees through to the following spring. So best management practices, you do everything that you can. And then if you still have losses, go from there with the colonies that survive and focus on those. Next question, Ashley Tipple, Shrewsbury, Mass. I'm interested in beekeeping mittens that you have for your five-year-old grandson. I can't seem to find anything like that, and I'm interested in getting them for my three-year-old. Nothing's funnier than to see a little peewee out in your bee yard in a full bee suit. These are the little mittens, by the way. Do 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 do. And they are goatskin mittens, and I guess they're not that popular, but this, by the way, you know, how do they look on my hand? They're little. But my five-year-old grandson, I have two five-year-old grandsons, and I like to put them in bee suits and let them go and park themselves right next to a beehive and look really close at the landing board. Where do those little mittens come from? Those come from the Flow Hive Company. So it's honeyflow.com. H-O-N-E-Y-F-L-O-W dot com. If you go there, click the shop button and then look at outfits. So they have, I have every size bee suit from them for toddlers, you know, elementary school age kids. So that no matter who shows up here, I have a bee suit to put them in. I don't have the super extra large bee suits and things like that. But for kids, I have them for my grandkids. So it's a lot of fun. And here's the thing. Flow hives are expensive, super expensive. Number one complaint that I get from everybody is flow hives cost so much, I hate that story. Anyway, one of the things that they sell that's actually a really good quality that does not cost that much, that's their bee suits. So that's one of their bee suits right there, a ventilated, ventilated bee suit from Flow Hive. They're reasonably priced. So when you get a bee suit for your little toddler or your elementary school child, they get the full bee suit gloves. The mittens are with the smallest ones. They also get their own hive tool. So it's pretty fun for little kids. I wish that I had a bee suit when I was little. I could have gone and just stared at bees like that. But that's where those come from. Honeyflow.com. And if you go to that website and you get inspired, you go there and you're like, oh man, look at these flow hives. Those things are cool looking. I wonder if I can get a discount. Yes, you can. In the video description down below right here, you get a $50 Discount coupon and get yourself a flow hive. Next question comes from M. So, hello, it's Mike from Tennessee. Hope you might please answer some questions for me on your next episode. Yes, I will. I'm starting three Layens hives this spring. 
I'm starting one, by the way. Each hive will have a three pound package installed. By the way, going against Dr. Leo right there, the three pound package, Dr. Leo does not like packages. The Layens hive I have uh, is from Dr. Leo's horizontalbeekeeping.com. Anyway, I already have frames ready. My frame type choices are drawn honeybee comb, foundation wax from Leo Sherishkin. Dr. Leo's foundation wax comes from Spain because he's trying to give us wax foundation that has the lowest pesticide residue out there. The studies of pesticide residues in commercial wax for foundation is terrible, by the way. And foundationless empty frames was wondering, should I start with eight or 10 frames? What sequence of frames would you recommend? So first I wanna give you a visual. Oh look, I just ha happen to have all this stuff from Dr. Leo. Do, 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 do. And that's a lay inside right there. And see that there are three entrances? There are three entrances, but that's just one insulated box. Oh, what's it insulated with? Sheep's wool. Pretty cool, huh? So anyway, the other thing is this lands hive, the cover is not insulated. That's up to you to do that. In fact, the color, the cover is very thin. But when we talk about their frames, and this was on my, the cover photo for today's episode, I did this, right? This is a deep Langstroth standard frame, 17 and 5 inches long and 19 inches for the top bar and so on. But the way they line up, look at this. This is the lands frame in comparison, just so you'll know. See that? So these are the frames that are going into Dr. Leo's lands hive that you get from him. By the way, it says it's ready to go, but it isn't. You still have to paint it and everything else, so it doesn't come finished. But look at the back of that frame. This is the top of the frame, and this is the top of the... Langstroth standard frame. See the gap? See the little shoulders there? And this one is so wide. These frames all go together and there is no venting or passage through to the top the way there is with Langstroth frames. So there won't be any putting food patties and things like that on top of these frames if you accept them the way they come. So what do I recommend? It says here, you know, do I put eight or ten frames? No, 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 no. Only put three or four of these in a row. And here's what I would do, since you're asking me. I would put a wax foundation frame, then I would put a foundation less frame, no frame, but you can leave these wires on there because they come that way. And then the third one would have a foundation and the fourth frame would be foundationless again. So what I did, I like to use the frames with foundation in them. Uh, and I have a video coming up showing you how to put the wax foundation in these just for kicks and giggles. Two methods of installing them. But uh, then we use them as a guide. So the foundationless frame, that's one that the bees would draw down. And look, there's no center guide for that up here. So you can put a starter strip along this if you want. But if you want to go straight foundationless, the bees are still going to draw it down. And you're going to see what they're going to do. It's part of the fun. Part of the experiment this year is to see how that goes. But there's also a solid divider, follower board, whatever you want to call it. So you would have four frames, the follower board, and then you have your entrance. One of three. So you leave that entrance open or you close it up part way. So when you're looking through, you know, just enough so the bees can come and go. Because you've got a brand new package of bees that you're installing in there. And uh, we don't want them to have to defend the full opening. The other thing is, when your queen first um, hatches out, because you're going to put a queen cage in there, and they're going to chew her sugar plug out of there, and then she's going to get out, and she's going to start doing her thing. And in the meantime, your bees are going to be drawing out comb and building the infrastructure that does not exist yet in your land's hive. So another thing that Dr. Leo tells you not to do is he doesn't want you to feed your bees. So he doesn't want you to use a package number one, and he doesn't want you to feed the bees because he likes a totally natural approach to the beekeeping. But they also just happen to sell, for those of you who want to feed your bees, they sell frame feeders. So the fifth frame, here's the entrance, 
fifth frame is a frame feeder that they sell at horizontalhive.com. I have no relationship with this company. I'm just naming them so that you can know stuff. Horizontalhive.com, that's where you go and get the frame. I would do that. I would put the frame feeder in there. Because I know we're trying to be faithful to all the things that Dr. Leo wants us to do. But uh, no more than four frames, fifth frame position, feeder, sugar syrup, one to one, so they can draw that stuff out. And then by the time that queen hatches out of her cage, she'll hopefully have some cells to start laying her eggs in and uh, to get going. And they can spread up from there. And then as they fill the frames, as they draw out the comb and it comes all the way down, I would not wait for the bees to draw the comb all the way to the bottom. If you've got two thirds of this full of comb and they're using it, I would start adding extra frames. Very easy, move the divider board over, slip in another frame. When you buy a Lance Hive from the Horizontal Hive Company, horizontalhive.com, uh, they give you all the frames for it. They're already assembled, they're ready to go. So it's actually very easy, but you do have to paint it, just like I said. And those metal corners that are on there, you have to install those too. And mine has a piano hinge running the full length of it. We'll see that this summer because we're going to be doing that. I'm going to be installing a swarm in there from my own because I can't just make a split because none of the frames are compatible. So I'm going to make, make, I'm going to collect a swarm. So I'm going to cause a swarm, allow a swarm to happen, put the swarm in my lands hive. And that's how they're going to get started, hopefully from a uh, weaver line of bees, but I'll take anything that swarms first, whoever's got the big swarms. Last question here is from Shirley Reed. I live one mile outside of Portsmouth, New Hampshire and keep bees on a small quarter acre lot. The girls never cease to amaze me. So excited they lasted the winter and I am preparing for a split and maybe to catch a swarm this year. Congrats on your hundredth episode. Thank you so much. And today it says the temps in Portsmouth reached 60 degrees on March 11th. That's crazy. The bees have done a few cleansing flights these last few weeks. Today, with the higher unseasonable temps, I watched quite a lot of activity. I have two deep boxes and recently put one-to-one -one sugar feeder on top under insulated cover. I don't think they're touching it so far. Also put a pollen patty on, in the top frame of the hive last week when temps allowed and that's a good move by the way I recommend that if you've got pollen patties sitting around this is the time to put them in there today I watched the girls come in with pollen not as much as I see in the summer but enough to pique my curiosity I see nothing in bloom as it is March in the middle of New England where are they getting the pollen to bring in is it from the pollen patty I put in thanks Shirley Okay, well, it's not from the pollen patty because when they use the pollen from the pollen patty, they metabolize that directly. So they're not, you know, scarfing out chunks of your pollen patty and then storing it in the frames. They're metabolizing it. So that's, that's that. If they're bringing the pollen from the outside and it's this pale pollen, it could be any, a number of things. So I'm going to tell you about an app for your phone that you can use to help speculate on what the pollen sources might be. Are you ready? It's PollenWise. PollenWise. It's an app for people that suffer pollen allergies. But the cool part of it is, when you have that app on your phone, it gives you day by day, and not just day by day, but the time of day that different pollen sources will be peaking. So when maximum mold will be, when and then when you slide to the right you get to see all the different trees that the tree species that are going to be producing pollen and things like that so early in the year the earliest pollen tends to come from trees where i live we're coming up on skunk cabbage so if you want to see something interesting that produces a very pale colored pollen by the way so if you're near wetlands that's a potential uh, skunk cabbage generates its own heat has its own pollen of course and the bees that get into those little saunas that it makes, um, it's a good 10 to 15 degrees warmer than the environment, so it can even melt its way through snow. Look up skunk cabbage sometime and see what that's about. 
So anyway, your bees could be bringing that in, but whatever, wherever they're getting it and bringing it in, it's not from anything that you've already got inside your, your beehive. So that's pretty much it. But if you want to know what's going on in your area, touch base with your local meteorologist. They often have access to a lot of information about pollen sources. And uh, years ago, I actually asked the local meteorologist if he would uh, mention when he gives his newscasts, when he gives his weather forecast, if he would mention pollen and the source of the pollen. It was really cool because he actually named the different uh, trees and stuff. So here where I am right now, maple trees are going to be providing resources for the bees early, but the next thing that's going to kick in will be willows. Salix discolor is uh, the one that brings in a lot of wetland pollen from the bees. Not open yet here where I am, and neither is the skunk cabbage. So I already know my bees are bringing in their pollen from my pollen sub that's put out there. So I'm gonna use that out, use that up as much as possible. So that was the last question for the day. So now we're just gonna talk some nonsense for a little bit here. And I do have to, again, give a shout out to Adam Holmes. Adam Holmes, energy out the wazoo. Not even kidding. So if you go to my website, thewaytobe.org, and there's a page on there that is for um, all of these Q&A videos. Adam actually did a document it's like a live document that he can update. And it is every episode by category, subject matter. Um, it's broken down so that you can search and find a specific topic that was addressed in this Q&A series of 101 videos as of today. So he goes in and adds and modifies it and amends it and then it, it's like I said, if you get the link of the document and you save that, then every time you access it, you'll also be accessing the update. So two things that are cool. Uh, one is that Adam also is the one that puts all the timestamps associated with the subject matter that we cover. So that when you're hearing it on Podbean, for example, and I reference something or I'm talking about something that needs a visual, if you click on that link in the Podbean comment section, it takes you to the YouTube video directly to the point where we're talking about that specific question. So that's cool. He's doing all that work. And if you see Adam Holmes in the comments anywhere on, tell him how much you appreciate it. I appreciate it. I told him I wanted to send him something or support him in some way. And he's just all, you know, no, thanks for all you do. And, you know, he's just happy to do it. I don't think the guy ever sleeps. And I'm really appreciative and I cannot believe that document that he put together. I don't know what kind of document you call it, but, you know, it's linkable, searchable. Man, just blows me away. Oh, the other thing is, a lot of people are thinking about stuff to plant in their yards for the pollinators. And I got this catalog that I was casually looking at. I have nothing to do with these people. But this is Prairie Moon Nursery. And the website is prairiemoon.com. So what's interesting about this is, this is all the native seeds and plants, wildflowers, grasses, and everything else. And stuff's expensive though, not gonna lie. But I looked in here and it has like, I'm trying to grow swamp milkweed as much as I can. Uh, anise hyssop, I planted that all last year. It did start growing, so that was cool. But, I mean, they even sell goldenrod in here and stuff like that, which I can imagine because we've got fields of it. But if you're trying to set up some kind of natural environment with native plants, pollinator-friendly. So the cool thing about this catalog is, if you've already heard about it, I'm wasting your time, but uh, plants that are suitable for shade, plants that are suitable for sun. Not just that, they sell the seeds and they also will sell little plants. They're expensive though. Like you can get $108, you know, they're all in the little planting pods and stuff like that, sun or shade. And of course, pollinator stuff, just like that. Anyway, I just wanted to mention it because I was impressed. 
And I already have most of these plants, so I was happy to say. I did not see Maximilian sunflowers in here. But if you're looking for a source for that kind of stuff, check out Prairie Moon. I don't have, you know, a discount or affiliate link or anything like that. I'm just mentioning them because it's beneficial to my viewers. And there was the special request for the 100th episode mug, The Way to Be. That's going to be available into next week. And then that's on Teespring and that's going to go away. So you can find a link to that also on thewaytobe.org. So if you've come this far and you've listened this far, I appreciate it. I'm glad that you were here and spent your time here. I hope it was useful. I hope it wasn't a waste of your time. So don't forget to click a like down here below so that you'll know that you've already watched this episode and then you don't need to repeat it. So thanks for being here. I hope that uh, even though we're going into a freezing weekend here, time to move your hives, uh, get your patties out there, Ultra B, dry pollen sub, if you're going to feed that, this is the time. They're using it. They're bringing it in. Once you start, continue. Don't start and stop. You'll cause a, a big uh, supply and demand issue inside your colonies. So if your bees died, um, do your best to improve from that, but please don't quit beekeeping. Bring in a bee mentor or someone who's seen it before to help you diagnose your bees. And uh, let's just do better every year, and hopefully we'll do better for our bees, and we'll find better bees to work with. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.